Now, Titus chapter 2, the part of the chapter that I wanted to focus on, is beginning in verse number 3, where the Bible reads, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The part that I really wanted to focus on is the part where it says keepers at home. Now, let me say this. Tonight I'm preaching about our beloved president, Barack Hussein Obama, and his recent statements that he made about women who stay home and raise their kids. I don't know if anybody heard these statements that he made, a few people. But let me just read for you these statements from the president of the United States he made a speech in Rhode Island uh, recently where he said, someone, someone, usually mom, leaves the workplace to stay home with the kids, which then leaves her earning a lower wage for the rest of her life as a result. And that's not a choice we want Americans to make. So let's make this happen. By the end of the decade, let's enroll six million children in high quality preschool. And let's make sure that we're making America stronger. So according to him, it's a bad decision. It's a decision that just we as Americans don't want to see people making. I mean, when one of the parents actually decides to stay home and raise the kid, you know, it's usually the mom. Uh, yeah, thank God. But, you know, we don't have a bunch of house husbands today. But, you know, the mom stays home and raises the children. And that's a decision that we don't want Americans to make. So we need to get them enrolled in a government preschool. And we need to get all these kids in the brainwashing centers as soon as we possibly can by age three or four or whatever. Now, the scripture actually teaches that it's good, that it's godly, that it's right for a mother to stay home and raise her children. In fact, that is the most important job that a woman could have. For example, when Adam named his wife, he called her name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Her, her very identity was wrapped up in the fact that she was a mother. That is actually an important job. Now, uh, go if you would to Proverbs 29, Proverbs chapter 29. Uh, while you're turning there, let me just make mention of the fact that in this scripture it says that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. This is not the ideal that is set forth by the world today. If you want to talk about a successful woman in the eyes of Barack Hussein Obama or in the eyes of just typical American society today, that's not what she looks like. You don't see a woman that is good and obedient to her husband and that loves her husband and loves her children and that's a keeper at home and doing housekeeping and taking care of important things at the house. No, it's a woman that has a career and she's a businesswoman and she's independent and she's doing her own thing. But you know, this is what a godly woman looks like according to the Bible. This is a virtuous woman that would take care of her children. And by the way, taking care of children is an important job. The saying goes that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. It's an important job. Look at Proverbs 29, verse 15. The Bible says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. See, the mother is shamed when the child is left to himself. Flip over to Job chapter 39. Job chapter number 39. Just a few pages to the left in your Bible. While you're turning to Job 39, let me read for you from Lamentations chapter 4 verse 3 where the Bible reads, Even the sea monsters draw out the breast. They give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people is become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. So the Bible there is talking about the sea monsters drawing out the breast. This is referring to the fact that whales, the, the largest animals in the sea, that's why it's called a sea monster, just because of its great size, are mammals. They actually do give suck unto their young. So, of course, the Bible is always very scientifically accurate to tell us that even the sea monsters draw out the breast and they give suck to their young ones. But it says, the daughter of my people has become cruel 
like the ostriches in the wilderness. So when God wants to give us a picture of what a cruel mother looks like, he gives us the ostrich as an example. Now look at Job 39 where we can learn more about the ostrich. It says in verse 13, Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth, and warmeth them in the dust, and forgetteth that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones, as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear, because God hath deprived her of wisdom, neither hath he imparted to her understanding. So the ostrich here is put forth as an animal that is without wisdom and without understanding. And notice, it's an animal that labors, it works, it goes to work, but its work is in vain because it's not taking care of its young ones. It doesn't care about the hazards or bad things that could happen to those young children. It's, as, it's almost as if they weren't even hers. She just doesn't even care, just drops them off somewhere and doesn't care what happens to them. Okay, this is what we see today being put forth as the ideal or the norm for women to give birth to a child and then go labor in vain at some career while the children are not being raised and cared for by their parents as the Bible teaches. You say, well, this is old fashioned. This is outdated. But see, the Bible's never outdated. People will talk, you know, you talk about Abraham and Sarah as being an example. And you could say, well, Abraham and Sarah, you know, that was 4,000 years ago. But here's the thing about that, though. In 1 Peter chapter 3, that's held up as an example where he says, even as Sarah also obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as you do well, are not afraid with any amazement. Okay, Peter is writing that a few thousand years after Abraham. So if it was good enough for Peter to point to something 2,000 years ago, then it's good enough for me 2,000 years later to point to Peter and to point to Titus and point to these scriptures. The scriptures are never outdated. And you say, well, times change. Well, times don't change for me. And for the Lord, they don't change. He said, I'm the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, let me point out something about the speaker. Go, if you would, to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23 uh, about the speaker of this quote, uh, Barack Obama. Let me start out by saying this. If you're going to be offended by me speaking against our leader, Barack Obama, let me say this. John the Baptist preached against the king of the land that he lived in. He preached against King Herod. And I'll tell you what he preached against him for. For having married his brother Philip's wife. See, his wife had previously been married to his brother Philip. And he married that woman. And John the Baptist got up and preached and said that it was wrong for him to marry the woman who had previously been his brother Philip's wife. And he ended up going to prison for that, and he ended up being beheaded for that. Okay, so he was willing, and, and Jesus said, among them that are born of women, there had not risen a greater than John the Baptist. He pointed out the sins and wickedness of King Herod. And I don't think that there's anything wrong today with us pointing out the sin and wickedness of our, of our so-called leader or ruler, uh, Barack Hussein Obama. Now, first of all, let me start out by teaching you this. Barack Obama, who's telling us how we should run our families and how we should raise our children, which is not the government's job at all. I mean, the government's job is, according to the Bible, Romans 13, just the punishment of evildoers. Not to sit there and educate us and raise us, but he's going to tell you ladies what you should be doing with your life. He's going to tell you ladies whether you should get a job or whether you should put the kid in daycare or, and say, well, hey, I don't want you to make that choice where you're a stay-at-home mom. Whatever you do, don't do that. He's going to say those things to you. But is he really qualified to make those type of statements about how to have a family and how mothers should raise their children when he is a literal bastard? Let's look at what the Bible teaches. He is a bastard. Let me show you from the Bible. Now, there are three mentions of the word bastard. You say, oh, you're cussing. No, I'm showing you what the Bible says. This is a Bible word. Okay, let me just show. And the Bible says every word of God is pure. Don't tell me that Bible words are impure. Let's look at the three mentions of the Bible of the word bastard. Okay, look at Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. This is the first mention. A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Now, of course, this is not a New Testament passage. This is not teaching that, you know, hey, bastards aren't welcome at church. That's not what this is teaching because this is under the Old Covenant, 
Old Testament. This has to do with the carnal ordinances of the tabernacle, later the temple, and things like that. So, you know, we're not applying this to New Testament teaching. But since the word bass was only mentioned three times, we need to turn here just to get this reference of it and see that being a bastard in the Old Testament was considered a shameful thing where God said, you know, you don't have a full citizenship in the nation if you're a bastard son, uh, according to Deuteronomy 23, verse 2. Go to Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah chapter 9 is another mention of the word bastard. The, the one that we're going to learn the most from is in Hebrews 12. So we're going to go to Zechariah 9 and we're going to go to Hebrews 12 because we want to define this Bible word. You know, what is a bastard? What does it mean to be a bastard? Um, and I'm going to show you that Obama is both physically bastard and spiritually bastard. Amen. Both. Okay. But let's look at this in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 5. It says, Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Geza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, For her expectation shall be ashamed, and the king shall perish from Geza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited, and a bastard shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of the Philistines. Now, what I believe that this is saying from studying the passage is that there's no longer going to be a legitimate king ruling in Ashdod. There's not going to be a legitimate prince of the Philistines that's going to be ruling in Ashdod, but rather that a bastard will be there, okay, in power. Because if you get the context, it's talking about who's in charge, who the kings are, the princes are, who's in power. And the reason that this is important is because when you think about kings and hereditary type of monarchies, it was very important to them who the son is. In fact, human history was altered when you think about the story of Genghis Khan and the Mongolian Empire, because Genghis Khan's wife was kidnapped from him before he was in power. And Genghis Khan's wife was kidnapped, and right around the time he rescued her from those who had kidnapped her, right around that time, she was found to be pregnant. So there was a question mark of, wait a minute, you know, is this even the physical, biological son of Genghis Khan? Or was it of those who had kidnapped her and given her to another man to be his wife? And so it just happened to be that his firstborn son just happened to have been born with these type of issues around it, clouding it. And so therefore, you know, years and years later when Genghis Khan is going to die, who's the successor going to be? You know, Genghis Khan recognized his firstborn son. He said, you know what? It wasn't her fault that she's kidnapped and everything. I'm recognizing, whether it is or not, he said, I'm recognizing it as my son. But after he's gone... You know, the second born is saying, you know, I'm the real son. You know, this is the bastard son or whatever. So th that's why these words are used here in Zechariah chapter 9, because in regard to ruling families, it was important to them to know, you know, who is the real legitimate son and who could be a bastard son, not the real legitimate heir to the throne. Go to Hebrews 12. And let me say this, by the way, the word bastard was never used in a negative context until the mid-1800s, where you would just call somebody, oh, you know, that guy, that bastard. That was not used until the mid-1800s. In fact, William the Conqueror, who conquered England from France in 1066, he was known even in official government documentation as William the Bastard. William the Conqueror, uh, and that was about a thousand years ago. And that's around the time that the word bastard even in, came into existence. Okay, But look, if you would, at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, it says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So what is God saying here? He's saying that if you're someone who is claiming the name of Christ and you can go out and live a life of sin and not be punished for it, no consequences. Basically, you're sinning and prospering. Everything's going well for you and you're not receiving any discipline or any judgment in this life. He's saying you must not even be saved because of the fact that whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he received. Now, some people will say, oh, if you're living a life of sin, you're not saved. But that's not true because Christians do go into sin. Christians do backslide. Christians do fall into sin and get away from the Lord. But the difference is that Christians are chastised for it. 
Christians who get away from the Lord, Christians who get out of church and go out and start living a life of sin are going to be punished for it. And he says, this is a thing of self-examination. If you are without chastisement, whereof all are partakers? Then are you bastards and not sons. What, so in that sense, what does he mean by being a bastard? Who you think your father is or who, you know, is being purported as your father or who would have been your father is not really.